We're going to start by looking and talking, maybe in more concrete terms, of what you would do to test the application. Um, testing is something that I don't think in the past has been emphasized enough in classes. I mean, in, in any classes, um, not just classes I've taught, but classes that I've taken, too. And testing is really important. Um, and what's really important about it is that you take a systematic approach, um, that you don't just like, well, we'll run a few things and see if it works, all right? Could just be a coincidence. Could have hit on those handful of things that just work out right, all right? Um, so we want to we wanna take a systematic approach. And uh, so we're going to look at a little bit on, on how, to, uh, how to do that sort of testing. Um, I'm then going to ask you, and you might want to start thinking about this, um, for what things you're finding confusing in this class. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time reviewing, uh, because this is a good break before we sort of get into our next topic. Because our next topic is a biggie. Uh, and, and that topic, which we might get to today, or we might start on Wednesday, is inheritance. Okay, So first off, let's pull down the example that we had last week and talk about creating some test cases for this. Now, one style of testing is testing without knowing anything about the code. That's sometimes called black box text testing. So, like, you, don't, you can't see inside the code. Um, that's where you'd have to look at sort of the business um, and see, like, what are all the conditions that could possibly happen. Another, another kind of testing is white box testing, where you look at the code. Because if you know how the code is written, that could help you a little bit in figuring out what to test. Because really, Every if statement sort of becomes part of a test case. All right? So let's look at what we have today. And we'll bring up the three. Oops the three classes, my 216 class. And remember, the unit test is where we're going to define those tests, all right? The unit test sort of serves as a, a, a surrogate user interface. Um, in a regular application, in a completed application, you're going to have, typically you're going to have a user interface that interacts with these classes. We're just defining the classes right now, though. We're defining the components. And therefore, we need something. We need something to do the testing with it. So instead of waiting until we have a GUI completed that we can do the testing there, we're going to create a test uh, uh, class. And that test class, all it's going to do is it's going to create instances of the component classes that we've created and run them through some tests by hard coding some values uh, and so on. Um, all right, so let's look at let's look at some of the things. We'll do some white box testing here, and we'll look at some of the things that we would test as far as orders go. First of all. We notice here that there's a calculate cost, calculate bake time. There's an add pizza. There's a construct. There's a couple of constructors. All right. Um, there are two constructors. One that accepts a customer name and one that accepts a customer name and a Boolean for delivery. Make sure they work. So one of your test cases would be create an order using 
one argument constructor. Two would be create an order using two argument constructor. OK. I thought for sure I pressed the button. Create an order using the one argument constructor, create an order using the two argument constructor. Now, when we get down to business here, we might actually design case, test cases that include a couple of these things. All right? For example, um, if we look at the pricing of a pizza, we see that the pricing of an order, oh, there was supposed to be an extra charge if is delivery order cost equals order cost plus two. All right, so we have that on there. So we should make sure that uh, a when we process a a um, order that is delivery, that the price is two dollars more than the sum of the pizzas. When we process one that is not delivery, um, we would process uh, as just the price of the pizzas. Finally, we want to check the, mac the bake time. And according to the bake time, the maximum bake time is considered to be the bake time for the whole order. So if I was developing test cases for this, I'm just going to look at the order first of all. Then we can look at the pizza. I might do this. Here, this might be one case. Create. one argument constructor, an order, add two pizzas, one large, thin width, one small, thick, without pepperoni. Man. Then make sure that the bake time and the price is correct. Should be able to test that, right? I mean, I should be able to, in my mind, come up with this. All right? I should be able to look and say, all right, um, a, small, a large thin crust will be, large thin crust with pepperoni will be, Eleven dollars. Small thick without will be eight dollars. Plus the two dollar charge is twenty one dollars. And then the bait time should be the maximum of this. So it should be since I have a thick crush, this should be sixteen minutes. So I know in advance what the result should be. All right. I've gone through and I've defined my test case, and I know advance in advance what the result should be. So if I go and run this, I'm going to look and say if it's right or not right. All right, and I can even put that in my unit test. So let's create using the one order. Using the one order, uh, let's create pizza Q to be large, or R is, is large with, P, with pepperoni. Q is a small without.
I can put in the comments. Test case one. I can put the details of it. Testing one argument constructor. One, one large width, one large or one small without, and I think I said thick and thin. So I better go and add those. Price should be 21, bake time 16. Cost for order 21, bake time 16. We have a winner. All right, so we covered a few of the things that we want to test. We covered the one constructor. Would maybe want to repeat the order using a different, the other constructor. All right, um, and set it to true, set it to false. All right, so that would be three test cases just to test the constructors. All right, and we can combine test cases, so we're not going to have necessarily millions of them. We want to test orders that have one pizza on them to make sure that is correct, multiple pizzas on them, and we probably want to test an order that has zero pizzas on it. We know it should be zero dollars and um, zero amount, so don't forget the unusual circumstances as well to test. Now, especially when we start talking about validation, so far our uh, we've been we've been living in a perfect world where we're just saying we're not going to worry about validation that everything's going to be okay. All right. But when we get into that, you're going to test for the unusual conditions. If someone tries to order a pizza for a non-existent size or a non-existent uh, value for crust or so on. And we have to make sure that works. So right now, the only unusual condition that I would say to test for would be an order that has zero things in. So test each constructor, so that's two, Test the second constructor with a true, the, the, the other one with a false, uh, uh, another test case with a false. So there's three just for that. We can combine maybe one of those pieces will make have zero items on it. Maybe one of them will have uh, one item. One will have multiple items. And then we need to t test all the combinations of pizzas. All right. Now, we can treat the pizzas individually and just make sure when we test the order that the pizzas that get put on the order are the ones being charged for. So notice we don't necessarily have to test every combination of pizza with every order. We run our tests for the pizzas and test all those scenarios. Large, medium, small, thick and thin crust, that would be six combinations. If, if my math is right, pepperoni, true or false, that's 12 combinations of pizzas we should test. So we could have a separate unit test or a separate section of the unit test that creates each of those 12 pizzas runs a test, make sure that the bake time and the price is right, then we can go and add some of those in different combinations to the order and make sure that the order calculations are correct. We don't have to make, we don't have to test every order scenario with all 12 combinations is what I'm saying. If you got the pizza right, if you know the pizza's right, and you verify that if you put a pizza on the order that it actually gets taken into account, then um, you should be okay. You don't have to test, again, every combination of pizza with every combination of order. 
that's where sort of the, the seeing the code and knowing how it works works to your advantage. You can see that, you, that if I guarantee that the pizza calculations are correct, all I have to do then is, is make sure that if I put pizzas on the order, that those pizzas and only those pizzas get included in the tally for the order. So in other words, make sure the bait time and the, the price is correct for uh, when I create orders. So to thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly test this, you, you have a lot of testing. 12 test cases for the pizzas. I would say at least um, three, four, five-ish for the order, each of the constructors, and then add, I'd test each of the constructors with a couple of pizzas. Then I'd test a uh, uh, an order with no pizzas, an order with one pizza, and, and that may be sufficient. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny little application, and we have 20-ish test cases, if, if I'm counting them right in my head. That's why testing is so hard, and that's why programs blow up, all right? Especially when you get into, like on a Windows system, having different uh, graphics cards, like for games, for example, or, or different situations, different drivers. All those things come to a factor, you know? Um, that's what makes testing so difficult, is that as soon as you start adding conditions, you get forks in the road. Each fork constitutes a test case. Everywhere in your code where you have an if statement, that's a test case. We have a code to test if it's small, medium, or large. To test price, that's a test case. We need to test a small pizza, medium pizza, and a large pizza. We need to test with or without pepperoni, because there's an if statement for that. We need to test the different kinds of crust, because there is uh, an if statement for that. All right. There's not an if statement, but there's loops in the order. Therefore, we have to make sure the loops work if they only do one iteration. Um, there's all, the classic problem in programming is plus or minus one. You know, you do a loop and you know how many times to do it, but a lot of times you're off by one. You try to do it one too many times or one too few times. So you want to make sure that if there's one order, or one piece on the order, it works right. If there's zero pieces on the order, it works right. Finally, if there is several pieces on the order, it works right. And you want to test all the constructors. So we want to test as thoroughly as possible. So if I see a case of someone turns something in where they've created something and they just have like one test case, that's not enough. You know, um, One of the things uh, I may ask you at some point is to write a test plan that would say, what are the different things that you would test to thoroughly test, uh, to thoroughly test what, um, what it is? Now here's the good thing. You can always keep this and then go and run it again if something changes. All right? So for example, uh, maybe the bake time, the rules for bake time changes. We, get it, we have a new oven so it can bake things quicker. All right? Well, we want to do what's called regression testing. We want to make sure that there wasn't inadvertently changes made that affects other things. So we would not just run maybe a single test, we would rerun this whole suite of tests. If you define the test cases in a unit test class, you might as well run them again. Make sure that they're all right. Taking into account whatever the adjustments were. So if there was an adjustment to the bake time, well then you, you would expect your results to be different just for that. All right. So test your code thoroughly. Try to think of all the conditions that exist in your code and make sure you have test cases that cover those as well as test cases that cover unusual circumstances. Again, right this minute, we're going to assume that we're in a perfect world, and you don't have to worry about validating that if someone tries to order a non-existent kind of crust or whatever. Um, but again, that will change later on. All right, what I'd like you, to, you all to do is spend a couple minutes thinking about what so far in this class is the most confusing thing for you. What is the one thing that maybe in the examples or in the homework that just you just don't get? So spend a couple minutes doing that, and we'll take down a list of them, and we'll cover as many of them as we can get today. If we cover them all, we'll start in inheritance. If we don't cover them all, we'll pick up the, the, the remaining ones on Wednesday and then start inheritance. Does anyone care to volunteer the thing they find the most confusing? Yes. Syntax. Syntax, like when I, I mean, I know that if you're just a primitive, I'm supposed to be, I think, a lowercase, and then when your name is uppercase, and then you basically have to get into uppercase. Okay. 
Okay, syntax as far as primitives, classes, um, naming conventions. And so on. Yes. Do you have your hand up? Constructors. Okay. The idea of them. Okay. Anyone else? Let's start with these two. Maybe our discussion will spur on further thinking and you can come up with one. First of all, syntax. Here's the good news of syntax. You're not going to get it wrong. All right? That's the good news. Why aren't you going to get it wrong? If you have the wrong syntax, it's going to compile. All right? Now, that really isn't good news, right? Because you could sit there for hours trying to figure out what's exactly what's wrong with it and so on. But syntax errors actually are the best errors to get because if you get those errors, a compiler will tell you them. All right? So let's look at a couple of different statements and a couple different things, and, and we'll try to break down those. All right? First thing, as far as declaring variables go. All right? Declaring variables, again, will either be a primitive or an object reference. All right? Because there are some differences as far as primitives and object uh, references. So I'm going to do it on the screen. If I'm going to declare an integer, it will be the name of the type and then the name of the variable. So int i would be to declare an integer. All right. A Boolean would be Boolean b double, double x and so on. All right. That's how you declare a, uh, a primitive. You can also, when you declare a primitive, you can set the value initially too. So I could say int i equals 5. Boolean b equals true. Double x equals 1.5. But you don't have to. All right? If you leave that off, then it gets a default value. For numbers, it's going to be defaulted to nothing. For um, for um, booleans, I think it gets defaulted to false, but I don't remember. I always initialize booleans because I can never remember what the compiler does. Uh, even if the even if the compiler does give a default, I usually put it in there just so I don't have to worry about that. All right, that is how to create a primitive and how to initialize it. All right. With objects, it gets more difficult. Because you have the name of the class that you have, so pizza p, pizza p, let's say. You can have that declaration by itself. That simply means that there's a variable, there's a storage location that's going to be called p, and that you're going to put a pointer to a pizza object in that variable. Later on down the line, you might do something like this, p equals new pizza. All right. These are two different statements and you can combine them into one if you want. But each half does two different things. This half creates a variable, creates a storage location and says what you are going to put into it eventually. All right? This does not create a object. All right? So no object is created there. All right? No object is created there. Just a object reference. And it will be initially set to null, which means it will point initially to no object until you assign it an object. How do you assign an object? Something like this would do it. Pizza 
or p equals new pizza. This says create a pizza object and store a pointer to that object in p. Now this instruction here does both of these things all at the same time. It says, okay, I'm going to create a variable for pizzas called p, and I'm going to put a pizza into it, and oh, by the way, here's a brand new pizza. Now, you don't have to say new. I could say, whoa. I could say something like this as well. If I had pizza r, I could say r equals p. Okay? And that would be legitimate. Because I'm putting in R a pointer to a pizza. Because P also contains a pizza. Now, calling a function is done, when you call a function, you have to supply the arguments to the function, if there are any. Those will be in parentheses. If there are no arguments to the, to the function, you simply um, have empty parentheses. So if I wanted to call, calculate cost on this pizza object P, I could say <coughs> x, which is a double, equals P dot calculate cost. I can do that because calculate cost is a function that's defined on pizza. It returns a double. So I can put the result in the variable x, which I declared as a double. All right? I have parentheses. This would not be allowed because calculate cost is a function. If the compiler sees this, it thinks that you're talking about a property or a variable. So without, um, without a uh, parentheses, the compiler will not recognize it as a function. It will think it as a variable, and it will give you an error, because there are no variables called calculate cost on, in the pizza class. But there is a function called calculate cost. And this doesn't accept any arguments. All right. If we want to use a variable in some sort of calculation, let's say, I don't know, I wanted to say z equals x times 2. And I declared a double z up here. This is, first of all, is an assignment statement. All right. An assignment statement takes the right-hand side of the equal sign, and it evaluates it. So it does the math, or it does whatever's on that side, and it comes up with a value. That value gets put in this variable. Now, the value that it comes up with has to be compatible to put in that variable. For example, if I had a string q, which equals hello, I couldn't say q equals x times 2, because this is a, num a number, and I can't put that number in a string. Likewise, I couldn't do z equals q times 2, because it doesn't make any sense to multiply a string. You put quotes around the things that are called literals. And literals mean literally the characters between those strings. So what's the difference between these two statements? How would the compiler interpret these two statements? String Q equals hello and quote. String equals hello not in quote. What's the difference between those two? The hello and quote come out. 
just those letters, right? What would this mean? That would have to have, it would have to identify somewhere as what the hello equals. Yeah, there would have to be a variable called hello. So in other words, the compiler would see this as being a variable hello, and it would see this as the, just the letters H-E-L-L-L. -L -L. So you could take this shortcut with strings to, to create a string this way. Now you wouldn't do something like this, again, as far as using parentheses, whoops, because x is not a function. x is a variable, so you'd never say x something like that. Now an if statement looks like this. You have the words if, in parentheses you have a condition, and that condition has to be a Boolean. A Boolean means it can either be true or false. So if I have x equals 1, I can specify these are the statements we do if x equals 1. Notice that there's a double equal sign there. When you do a comparison, you use a double equal sign. All right? The brackets indicate a block of statements. And each statement would be, would be followed by a semicolon. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put actual statements here, I'm just gonna put the word statement. So if you had four statements, they're enclosed in that block, all four of these statements would get executed if that condition was true. We can also add an else that would do the statements we want to do if they're false. All right? We can combine conditions either with an and or an or. The two ampersands mean that um, both conditions have to be true for the big condition to be true. Remember, the big condition is what gets evaluated and determines if the if statement gets executed or not. A big condition can be broken down into two like smaller subconditions. And if they're separated by an and, then both of them need to be true in order for the condition to be true. They can also be separated by ors, which means one or the other or both have to be true. So both of them are true. If one of them's true, the other one's true. That's all considered true. You can do a lot of things with conditions, just most of the ones that you'd expect. Um, you can say uh, equals, again, using the double equal sign. You can say greater than, less than or equal to, whatever makes sense for the particular thing that you're doing. For loops, we have a similar thing with the blocks, where I can say for int i equals 0, i less than 10, i plus plus. And what that will do is I will do this block of statements here. It will initialize the variable to 0. So the first time through the loop, i is going to have a value of 0. The second time through the loop, i is going to have a value of 1. We're going to add one to it each time through the loop. That's what this means. We're going to do this, we're going to continue this as long as i is less than 10. So, we'll actually execute the body of this loop 10 times. i will have a value of 0 all the way through i having a value of 9. That's 10 occurrences. When we get right here, when we come out of that loop, i is going to have a value of 10. Because we do the last increment, we see that it's no longer less than 10. We pop out of the loop, so if I did a print right here, I would have a value of 10. These are particularly good for looping through arrays and array lists. Because remember, this loop works best if we know how many times we're going through the loop. All right? And with an array or an array list, we know how many times we're going through the loop. We're going through the loop probably one for every element in the uh, array or array list. Other syntax questions that you might have? Anyone? 
Um, a lot of this just deals with practice, just doing it, getting an error. If you can't see what the error is, the the bad thing about this is that sometimes an error that you make will show as a bunch of errors. One small mistake will show as a bunch of errors because the compiler sort of gets out of whack and doesn't know what's what anymore and, and gives you a bunch of errors. Yes, you had a question? What other type of for loop? Oh, yeah, like a for each. I don't use this one too often, but I will try to we'll try to write the same loop using both syntaxes. All right, if you remember, we have an array list called pizzas in the order. All right, if we wanted to loop through and get the cost of all the pizzas on the order to calculate the total cost, we could do something like this. Forget all this stuff. This is starting like with a new example. Unless I'm missing something here, those two are the equivalent. All right. Both of them we initialize cost to zero. Okay, fair enough. In one, we say, give, repeat this loop for every value of i, starting with zero, and going as long as i is less than a number of um, pieces in that array list. So if there's three pieces, would do it as long as i is less than three. So i would have a value of zero, one, and two. So those would be the three that would get. So I loop through, I grab a pointer to the pizza in that particular slot, either in the slot zero, slot one, or slot two, in order. First time through slot zero, second time through slot one, third time through slot two. I then get the value of the, that pizza, or the cost of that pizza by saying, P dot calc cost, calculate cost, and add it to cost. All right, that's the kind of syntax I've been using in class. All right, and that's the kind of syntax I'm used to, so I'll probably use that. All right. This effectively does the same thing. It just assumes a couple of things. The compiler assumes a couple things for you and does a couple things for you. Each iteration through the loop this variable p is going to be the next pizza on the list. So the first time I execute this loop, p is going to have the first pizza on the order. Second time I execute the loop, this pizza is going to have the second pizza in the order, and so on. And it will do it as for as many pizzas as there are in the array list. 
So this would be the array list. This is what you want to call each pizza, the next pizza in the list. And then we can do this functionality. So really, um, in my mind, it's a matter of which you think is more clear, straightforward. Other than that, they, they, these two would do the same thing. This sort of has the get and the counting all rolled up into this. This says I'm going to execute this once for every pizza in that array list. And each time through the loop, P is going to be the next. That should be an I there. P is going to be the next item in the pizza array list. Anything that's defined as a collection, um, there, there's, we'll, we talk about inheritance uh, later on, but um, array lists are. Anything that would fit probably one of these things would be fair game. So probably anything that was an abstract collection, you could probably do that for. Typically, it's going to be an array list, though. Other questions on syntax? All right. Constructors. When we execute a statement that looks like this, we're actually doing two or three things, depending on how you count it. And we could do this in, we could look at them in any order. We're doing this part, we're doing the equal sign, and we're doing the new pizza part. Pizza P does this. It creates in an area of memory called the stack, it creates a variable called P. And this variable is only allowed to hold pointers to pizzas. So if I tried to do something like this, pizza p equals hello, boom, I get an error because hello is not a pizza object. So I can't stuff a string or a string object reference in a pizza ob uh, uh, object reference. I couldn't even stuff an order in there, right? Because it's not a pizza. By saying this part, this says that P can only point to pizzas. Can't point to orders. Can't point to any other object that we have. Only pizzas. This part is the code that calls a constructor. All right? And I'm going to assume for now that we don't have any constructors on the pizza class. Let's assume that we don't have any constructors yet on the pizza class. What this will do, if I say new pizza, it will set aside the amount of memory in the heap for a pizza object. Now, what does a pizza object contain? It contains some attributes. All right, it contains a size and a type of crust. And whether or not it has pepperoni. And it has some functions that we can call on it, like calculate cost, calculate bake time. So, 
if I call it and there's no constructors, it will create this object on the heap. It will give it some location in memory and it will create it. And it will create all these properties and all these methods, but it's not going to initialize any of them. All right, that constructor won't initialize them. The final part then is the equal sign is, is whatever this memory location is gets put in that variable. So that has a linkage between this and this. And that's what the equal sign does. It says take the address that you stored this and, and store it in that pointer. And that's OK, because that is a pointer to a piece object. So everything's OK. Now, with a constructor, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. We could default certain things about a pizza, maybe. But when we make a pizza, we need to know certain things about it the second we make it. Is it going to be large or small? Is it going to be medium uh, or is it going to be thin crust or thick crust? Is it going to have pepperoni in it or not? So a constructor with no arguments, none of these things get defaulted. We can create a pizza with an argument, though, uh, with a constructor, though, that accepts arguments and allows us to do two things. To create that pizza, to set, up, set it aside in memory, and all that, and also initialize those attributes. So we're, we're, we're adding like an extra step or an extra piece of functionality in there. So we could create a, a, a constructor on pizza We'll say public, there's no return value for a constructor. Then I list the arguments that I'm going to give it. I might give the, the pizza a, a string that is the size and a string that is the type of crust and a Boolean that is whether it has pepperoni. So if I call that constructor, if I say pizza p equals new pepperoni, and wherever you see the new, that's when a constructor is, I didn't want new pepperoni, equals new pizza. Wherever you see new, that's the constructor being called. I can give it some argument. So I could give large, thin, Yes, has pepperoni. So when this constructor is called, it will find in the class a constructor that has two string arguments followed by a Boolean. If it can't find a constructor that has two string arguments and a Boolean, it will give you an error. But if it can find it, it will give you, it will execute that code. And so what I would do then is I would set the properties in the pizza using the value of the arguments. So this allows us to do two things. Create the pizza and already assign some values to it. All right. I think in the earlier examples, we had set functions. We created the piece with no argument, and we said set crust is this, set size is this, set pepperoni is that. And you can still do that. The constructor just allows you to do that right, at, uh, right off the bat as soon as you're creating it. And the rationale for that is for some things it doesn't make sense to have one of these objects floating out here that doesn't have values for certain things. So we give the person that's writing the code the opportunity to set those parameters like from the value of a user interface or whatever. We can have multiple constructors then if we want to default certain things. So in this case, we actually have two constructors for pizza, maybe three. We have three. We have one that has three arguments, arg size, arg crust, and arg pepperoni and we set those values 
based on the arguments. We have one that accepts two arguments, the size and pepperoni. And we default the crust to thin. And then finally, we have one that accepts no arguments that we uh, default all three of the properties to whatever is the default for our organization, for our pizza place. So that's sort of the idea of the constructor. We can create an object and set the values of its properties at, at one time. All right. Other questions about this or anything else? Think of stuff that you are still not sure on. Um, and we can talk more about this on Wednesday. Um, and when we get that wrapped up, then we will talk about um, inheritance. All right, see you in lab. <laughs>